Subcommittee on Energy and Oversight will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, The EPA Renewable Fuel Standard Mandate. Uh, I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning and welcome. This is a Joint Energy and Oversight Subcommittee hearing examining the Renewable Fuel Standards, or RFS. Today we're going to hear from witnesses with direct experience navigating this complex and outdated mandate. The RF, RFS was designed to increase the use of renewable sources of transportation fuels in order to reduce United States reliance on foreign oil and also reduce vehicle emissions. But Congress, when it enacted this mandate, based it on overly ambitious projections about gas consumption, the availability of renewable fuel vehicles and infrastructure, on biorefinery technology, and even the market demand for renewable fuels. In almost every one of those categories, the RFS, or in almost every category, I should say, the RFS projections are outdated and do not reflect today's energy market. The RFS was wrong about gas consumption. Demand for gasoline is actually falling. The RFS was wrong about the growth of the renewable fuel industry, particularly in terms of advanced biofuels and cellulosic fuels. And the RFS was wrong about the impact incorporating renewable fuels would actually have on the environment. As one of our witnesses today will testify, the corn ethanol produced to meet the RFS actually makes air quality worse and has higher life cycle emissions than gasoline. Today, instead of a transportation fuel supply driven by consumer demand, we are stuck with our back, pardon the pun, to the blend wall. Each year, the RFS requires higher volumes of renewable fuel than our transportation fuel supply can sustain. Even with EPA approval to use mid-level ethanol blends like E15 and E85 in select vehicles, both, I might add, of which have significant problems in terms of performance and emissions, the RFS mandate is still unworkable. This leaves refiners at the mercy of unreliable annual waivers from the EPA that set the standard at achievable levels, when EPA even bothers to follow the law and announce those requirements on time. And American consumers are stuck with higher prices and less options at the pump. The RFS shows that the federal government cannot use mandates to create a functional industry out of thin air. Production of renewable fuels has increased, but demand for fuels with higher blends of ethanol simply does not exist, even in the most favorable market conditions. While the federal government has an important role in energy research and development, including developing efficient transportation fuel technologies, federal mandates are the wrong approach approach to fueling innovation, and let me add the wrong approach to innovating fueling, if you pardon that pun. I want to thank our witnesses today for testifying on the challenges of the RFS in today's energy market, and I look forward to a discussion about the consequences caused by the federal government's intervention in the American energy market. In the case of the RFS, like so many other instances of federal government mandates, the results are disastrous. Congress has the opportunity to fix the problems caused by this outdated and misinformed law, and we should advance legislation to repeal the RFS. We can't afford to hijack economic growth by continuing with a law that is at odds with reality and will raise costs for American consumers. And I'd like to rec recognize Mr. Grayson for his statement. Thank you, Chairman Weber and Chairman Laddermilk, for holding this hearing today. Currently, the United States consumes more oil than any other nation in the world, 18.9 million barrels per day. China's next at only 10.8 million barrels per day. The sheer volume of America's oil consumption means that we are constantly spurring global climate change and disruption and its disastrous consequences. Further. Our oil consumption leaves America heavily dependent on the global market for oil, and this reliance makes our economy vulnerable. Any significant supply disruption can have catastrophic effects on our economy. 
These concerns, however, can begin to be addressed by the sustainable use of biofuels and long-term policies like the Renewable Fuel Standard, which is what we're here to talk about today. This policy, signed into law twice under President George W. Bush, requires an increase in the production of biofuels that can be introduced into the market. The renewable, renewable fuel standard has resulted in greater production of alternative fuels and has created a burgeoning market for them. Breakthrough technologies have emerged, as have innovations and new infrastructure that are changing the biofuel landscape every day. As we will hear from Dr. Hill, over the long term we need to move away from corn-based ethanol due to its supply limitations. In the short term, we need to ensure that efficient, sustainable practices for producing corn-based ethanol are sufficiently incentivized and enforced. We must also ensure that the market for these first-generation fuels is establishing the necessary infrastructure and investments that will lead to truly sustainable, advanced biofuels. The expansion of the renewable fuel standard in 2007 was designed to do just that by increasing levels of advanced biofuels through annual volumetric requirements, requirements that I hope that industry and the EPA can come to an agreement on and then so that EPA can uh, begin announcing annually once more. I look forward to hearing from each of you, our witnesses on today's panel, and I want to thank you for being here. In particular, though, I'd like to thank Mr. Redd for testifying. As you will hear, Mr. Redd is the Vice President of Fuels Development at Applied Research Associates in Panama City, Florida. His company is working on breakthrough products that could be used as drop-in advanced biofuels to replace diesel and jet fuel. He will note that these types of innovations wouldn't have been possible without the renewable fuel standard, which I believe is an important perspective for all of us to hear today. While they may not be the sole solution to the glaring problem of climate disruption, biofuels, especially advanced biofuels, are a step in the right direction. Without the renewable fuel standard, we would not even be here discussing the significant progress made in biofuels over the past decade. I look forward to what the next decade in biofuels holds in store. And again, I look forward to hearing from each one of you this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Grayson. I now recognize the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight, Mr. Loudermilk, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone. I would also like to welcome and thank all our witnesses for being here today. The Renewable Fuel Standard was established in 2005 with the signing of the Energy Policy and expanded significantly the Ener Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. At that time, gasoline consumption was on the rise, America's reliance on foreign oil was increasing, and renewable fuels were just starting to become an option for consumers. In drafting the Renewable Fuel Standard, Congress projected that gas prices and consumption would increase and established increasing requirements for incorporating renewable fuels into the transportation fuel supply. But today's energy market is remarkably different than that what Congress projected in the renewable fuel standards. Gas consumption has declined, and the technology has opened door for an abundance of domestic oil and gas. While production of renewable fuels has increased and blended fuels are more widely available to consumers, the refining capacity and market demand for transportation biofuels projected in the RFS simply does not exist. Instead of large increases or instead of a large increase in renewable fuel production to match RFS targets, refiners must navigate a complex fuel credit system, buying or trading for renewable identif identification credits or RINs to show that enough biofuels have been produced to meet RFS requirements. Since biofuels aren't produced at adequate levels, the EPA must continually waive the production volumes required in the law, causing uncertainty for producers and consumers. As fuels with higher blends of ethanol, like E15 and E85, are introduced into the fuel supply in order to meet the RFS mandate, the law can even cause confusion for consumers. While fuels with ethanol content higher than 10% are approved for use in newer vehicle models, mid-level ethanol blends can damage small engines like lawnmowers, boats, motorcycles, and are not approved for these uses by the EPA. Adding fuels with higher blends of ethanol to more gas stations around the country may help meet RFS requirements, but it offers nothing more than a nuisance to regular Americans as more gas stations have to sell fuels that they can't even use. And consumers with vehicles that are compatible with E15 often choose lower blends of ethanol or fuel without any biofuels 
due to the lower performance of fuels with higher percentage of biofuels. Simply put, the RFS, mandate the, sale of, the RFS mandates the sale of fuels with low demand. The federal government has no business mandating the sales of fuels that many Americans don't want to buy. And while the EPA projected, significantly, projected significant environmental benefits from an increased use of biofuels, the fuel efficiency and life cycle emissions for biofuels are in direct contrast to EPA's projections. So the American people are stuck with law mandating less efficient fuels that are more damaging to air quality than gasoline. It's time for Congress to make a change. When existing law is unworkable, Congress must listen to stakeholders and adjust the law as it is needed. Our hearing today will examine some of the challenges to comply with the RFS in today's market. As economic conditions change, Congress must evaluate the laws it creates and adjust mandates to reality. I hope that this hearing will bring to light some of the unintended consequences of the renewable fuel standard and provide guidance to lawmakers as we decide the future of this law. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Loudermilk. And let me introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Ms. Mr. Matthew Storch. Is it Stork? Smorch. Okay, well, we've got a typo here. Obviously, this printer was fueled by biofuels. Did I say that out loud? Vice President of Strategy and Supply for Country Mark. Uh, and Mr. Smorch received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Michigan Technological University and is a graduate of the Hoosier Fellows Program at Indiana University's Tobias Center for Leadership Excellence. Welcome, Mr. Smorch. Our next witness is Dr. Jason Hill, Associate Professor of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Hill received his bachelor's degree in biology from Harvard and his Ph.D. in plant biological sciences from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, doctor. Our next witness is Mr. Chuck Red, Vice President of Fuels Development of Applied Research. So, by the way, was he in your district? Uh, nope, but he's a Floridian, so he'll be voting for me next year. Okay, all right. Um, Mr. Red received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the United States Naval Academy and his master's degree in business management from Troy University. Welcome, Mr. Red. And, you, and he has a Texas connection, I might add. Uh, our final witness today is Mr. Tim Reed, Director of Engine Design for Mercury Marine. Mr. Reed received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Iowa and his master's degree in mechanical engineering from University of, of Wisconsin. Welcome, Mr. Reed. I now recognize Mr. Smorch for five minutes to present his testimony. Chairman, ranking members, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify in today's hearing on the Renewable Fuel Standard. I'm Matt Smorch, and I serve as Vice President of Supply and Strategy for Countrymark Cooperative. Countrymark is the only farmer-owned integrated oil company in the United States. The Countrymark refinery uses 100 percent American crude oil sourced in the Illinois Basin. Even though we're a small business refiner, we have a large impact on the state of Indiana where we supply over 65 percent of the agricultural market and 50 percent of the school districts in the state. Over 130,000 farmers in Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Ohio participate in local cooperatives through which they benefit from ownership in Countrymark. As a supply cooperative, Countrymark's mission is to provide those quality products that our members require for their independent fuel and lubricants businesses to be successful. Countrymark started using renewable fuels long before we were required to do so by the RFS. Being a small refiner, Countrymark did not become an obligated party until January of 2011. Regardless, we started blending biodiesel in 2006, and in 2008, we started blending 10 percent ethanol in our gasoline. We recognize that there is a place for ethanol in the gasoline pool. My testimony focuses on the challenges we have with increasing RFS mandates over E10. We believe the E10 blend wall is real. The E10 blend well is created by the physical properties of ethanol and the one-pound vapor pressure waiver provided by the Clean Air Act. This waiver is not available to higher ethanol blends, which make them uneconomical to produce. An important assumption in the EPA proposal for 2016 is an increase in E85 demand and a decrease demand of E0. To meet EPA's levels would require E85 sales to increase between 31 percent and 684 percent. Plus, these EPA increases have to materialize 
in less than six months. Even with Indiana's passenger fleet having 20% flex fuel vehicles and 15% of Countrymark branded stations selling E85, Countrymark's experience shows E85 is not the answer. The majority of our gasoline sales are E10. And if you could show the first slide. This is figure two from my written testimony, and it shows the percentage of Countrymark's total gasoline sales for both E85, which is in the blue, and E0 in the red. It can be seen that our sales of gasoline without ethanol, the E0, makes up a higher percentage of our total gasoline sales than E85. We sell six and a half times more E0 than E85. While seasonally adjusted E0 sales are increasing, E85 sales are decreasing. In fact, one of our members recently converted E85 pumps to E0 service at two locations. Can you show the next slide, please? Figure three from my test written testimony shows the expanded analysis that we did to compare E10 sales, which are in the red columns, to E85 sales in the blue columns for retail stations, stations that sell both products side by side. This sample of stations clearly show that when customers have the option to purchase either E10 or E85, E10 is the preference. On average, E85 sales only comprise 3.5% of total station gasoline sales. With Indiana's infrastructure, we would expect the percentage of E85 sales would be greater. In 2014, Countrymark sold a little over a million gallons of E85, which is only 2.7% of the amount that we would have expected if customers were fairly purchasing E85. Even today, with selling a million gallons of E85 a year, and blending 10% ethanol in the majority of our gasoline and almost 2% biodiesel in all our diesel fuels, Countrymark cannot blend enough renewable fuels to meet our annual obligation under the RFS. We are a net buyer of renewable fuel credits, and for 2015, we project those costs to be over $4 million. Countrymark will continue to blend ethanol and biodiesel. We don't support repeal of the RFS because it is now woven into the fabric of rural America where we operate. However, Countrymark supports an IRFS or an amount of ethanol that market reality support, which is E10. When mandates and market realities conflict, the market reality should win. Our experience shows E85 sales on a downward trajectory, so it will continue to face a difficult road in meeting the IRFS. Our only com compliance option will be to purchase credits in the market for our shortfall, which in turn will increase our operating costs putting both Countrymark and our farmer owners' investment at risk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smorse. Dr. Hill, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman, ranking members, and members of the subcommittee, good morning and thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'm Jason Hill, Associate Professor of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering at the University of Minnesota and a resident fellow of its Institute on the Environment. My research focuses on understanding the environmental effects of the world's energy and food systems, and especially where they intersect in the, glowing, in the growing bioeconomy. My work is funded by grants from the Department of Energy, USDA, EPA, and the State of Minnesota. I'm pleased to describe, as you've requested, my ongoing research into the environmental impacts of biofuels. Much of the research that I described today was conducted with my colleagues Julian Marshall and Chris Tessin. I offer this testimony entirely on my own behalf. One of the goals of the Renewable Fuel Standard is to reduce the negative environmental impacts of transportation by increasing biofuels. But is this an effective approach? Are biofuels truly cleaner than conventional fuels? To answer this question, we need to compare these fuels over their full life cycle. That is, we need to consider the damage caused by producing them in addition to burning them. For gasoline, the life cycle includes extracting and refining crude oil, distributing and combusting the gasoline itself. The life cycle of corn ethanol involves growing and fermenting grain and distilling, distributing, and combusting the ethanol itself. Just how important is this life cycle approach? If we were to ignore the pollution that is released from producing these fuels, as many others have done, we would es underestimate their impacts. Take corn ethanol, for instance. Most of the pollution that contributes uh, to increased fine particulate matter and ozone levels is emitted when it is produced, 
not when it is burned. We focused our analyses on these two pollutants as they cause the overwhelming majority of health pollution, um, air pollution health impacts. Corn ethanol has higher life cycle emissions than gasoline of five major pollutants that contribute to fine particulate matter and ozone levels. Cellulosic ethanol, which we explored as derived from corn stover, emits greater amounts of some pollutants than gasoline and lower amounts than others. It is also worth noting that using gasoline more efficiently, such as in a hybrid vehicle, reduces uh, emissions of all five pollutants. How do these emissions affect human health? Well, that answer depends in part on where these emissions occur and where they travel, since what we really care about is how many people breathe dirty air and how much pollution they inhale. We therefore first estimated how levels of fine particulate matter and ozone change as a result of producing and using each fuel. We then calculated the damage to human health and well-being that would result from these changes in air quality. We found that producing and using a gallon of gasoline in a conventional vehicle results in air quality related health costs of about 50 cents per gallon. For corn ethanol, this cost is nearly double. This difference is largely due to ethanol production having greater pollutant emissions than gasoline production and not due to differences in tailpipe emissions, which are relatively small. Increased mortality from ethanol production occurs largely in the Midwest and Eastern U.S. For both fuels, nearly all the health damage is caused by fine particulate matter rather than by ozone. We also found that producing and using a gallon of corn stover ethanol results in comparable costs to gasoline, again about 50 cents per gallon. Although increased mortality occurs in the corn belt, some areas air quality actually improves. Let's return to our original question of whether the renewable fuel standard reduces the negative environmental impacts of transportation. With res um, our research shows, at least with respect to air quality, that the answer is no. In fact, because the renewable fuel standard has been met almost entirely with corn grain ethanol, it makes the air worse. This finding is consistent with EPA's own findings, which found um, uh, increase, uh, increasing average levels of fine particulate matter and ozone led to up to 245 cases of premature mortality annually. What role could cellulosic play, uh, fuels play in clearing the air? They have the potential to be no more damaging than gasoline and perhaps somewhat better. Still, they're not produced on a large scale, and so their effects are less certain. The renewable fuel standard will continue to damage air quality as long as it supports corn grain ethanol, regardless of how the cellulosic biofuel industry develops. Increasing the efficiency of corn grain ethanol may lessen its environmental impacts, but even dramatic improvements would be unlikely to make it less damaging than gasoline. Alternatively, we know that other options are likely to improve air quality, including increasing vehicle efficiency, electrifying vehicles with low emission and renewable sources of electricity, promoting public transportation, and redesigning infrastructure. These are the options that we should be pursuing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Mr. Red, you are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, ranking members, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm Chuck Redd, Vice President of Fuels Development at Applied Research Associates, known as ARA. ARA is a science and technology company with a 1,000 employee owners. Um, ARA has conducted renewable fuel development since 2006. The goal of my testimony today is to give you a snapshot of the future of second-generation renewable fuels and to, and to discuss the central role that the renewable fuel standard plays in second-generation renewable fuel development commercialization and industry growth. Ethanol and methyl ester biodiesel are considered first generation renewable fuels. First generation fuels are characterized by small reductions in greenhouse gas emissions compared to petroleum and are typically blended at low rates with petroleum, 5 to 10 percent. ARA has focused our research development and commercialization efforts on second generation renewable fuels. Our feedstocks, what we're putting into our fuels, what our fuels are made of, are fats, oils, and greases, many of which are waste products. These feedstocks can be from waste sources such as brown grease from water treatment or grease traps, yellow grease, uh, used cooking oil, animal fats from rendering facilities. Other sources of feedstocks include algae and non-industrial, non non-food uh, non crop oils. One promising non-food crop oil is Carinata. It's a mustard seed. Carinata is being commercialized by a company called Agrosoma Biosciences. 
Crop oils such as Carinata can provide additional revenue for American farmers by growing in, in rotation with the food crops that they're growing today. Um, they can also serve to increase the yields of food crops such as wheat uh, by, by uh, breaking up the, the ground so the um, food crops can grow better. These um, rotation crops can also provide a, a very high protein meal uh, for animal feed as well. ARA is teamed with a world leader in hydro processing technology, Chevron Lummis Global, which is a 50-50 joint venture between Chevron and CBI Lummis for the commercialization and licensing of our patented 100% replacement renewable fuels production process. Our process is known as biofuels isoconversion. The first phase of our process uses water as a catalyst at supercritical high temperature and high pressure to quickly convert fats, oils, and greases into a renewable crude oil. This renewable oil, when hydro-treated, has the same molecular makeup and boiling range distribution as petroleum crude. As a result, our process makes a 100% replacement for petroleum crude, allowing jet fuel and diesel fuel made with our technology to meet petroleum specifications without blending with petroleum-based jet or diesel fuel. To our knowledge, our technology produces the only jet and diesel fuels being tested by the U.S. military that are 100% replacements for petroleum-based uh, jet fuel. In 2012, the National Research Council of Canada flew a jet plane with the first ever 100% biofuels phase of flight that met all petroleum span standards using our jet fuel, which we call ReadyJet. ReadyJet was, de was demonstrated to meet all petroleum jet fuel standards without blending. Our fuels have been tested by numerous engine manufacturers, including GE, Rolls, Pratt & Whitney, Honeywell. Our ReadyJet fuel produces less than 50% of the emissions in particulate and black carbon of petroleum jet fuel while reducing lifetime greenhouse gas emissions by more than 80%. Significantly, in, in jet engine tests, ReadyJet was more efficient than its petroleum counterpart, requiring 1.5% less fuel to produce the same amount of thrust. ReadyJet and Ready Diesel fuels are being certified as 100% drop-in replacement fuels by the U.S. Navy right now. In May, we delivered over 50,000 gallons of fuel for certification to the U.S. Navy, and we're going to deliver an additional 90,000 gallons of fuel for certification to the Navy in fiscal year 16. ARA and our partners, Chevron Lummis Global, have cleared some of the toughest hurdles towards full certification and adoption of ReadyJet and Ready Diesel as replacements for petroleum fuels. I'm proud of our team and thankful for all the support that we've had from our testing partners and feedstock partners. We're producing fuels at 100 barrel per day unit operated by Blue Sun Energy, one of our licensees at their facility in St. Joseph, Missouri now. Uh, taking new technology to commercial scale is perhaps the most challenging task of all. We have four commercial licensees of our biofuels isoconversion technology. Two producers have begun engineering and design for production facilities to provide renewable jet and diesel fuel for the Navy, airlines, and other aviation and diesel fleet customers. Each of our licensees is counting on the renewable fuel standard to provide a market for renewable jet and diesel fuel to support the investment of tens of millions of dollars to produce 100% drop-in Ready Diesel, Ready Jet, and other high-value byproducts at scale. Two of our licensees, Ametis and Blue Sun Energy, are currently operating commercial plants, producing a combined 100 million gallons per year of first-generation renewable fuels, and are looking forward to the RFS providing the, the power behind moving towards uh, next-generation fuels. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Red. Mr. Reed, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Weber and Loudermilk and members of the Energy and Oversight Subcommittees. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to discuss the Renewable Fuel Standard, E15, and its particular impact on the recreational boat community. My name is Tim Reed, and I'm the Director of Engine Design and Development at Merck Marine, a division of Brunswick Corporation, located in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Merck Marine has been a member, uh, manufacturer of recreational marine engines continuously since 1939, and currently makes and sells more engines than any other marine manufacturer in the world. I'm here today to discuss the Renewable Fuel Standard and E15 fuels on behalf of the National Marine Manufacturers Association, which represents over 1,500 boat builders, marine engine, and marine accessory manufacturers. The vast majority of the current production marine engines are open loop with no capability to correct for oxygenated fuels. This is especially true for the in-use fleet, which is recognized to be over 40 years old. The key point to remember if, when considering ethanol blending is its effect as an oxygenator. On a typical marine engine, the additional oxygen makes the fuel burn hotter and the higher temperatures can reduce the strength of the metallic components. Run quality issues can also occur when the engine operates leaner than its combustion system limits. In addition, ethanol can cause compatibility issues with materials in the fuel systems, 
because of the chemical interaction. A study conducted by DOE, NREL, and Volvo Penta showed that the 4.3 liter stern drive engine when durability tested on E15 exhibited emissions degradation beyond its certification limit. In addition, throughout its testing, the engine exhibited poor starting characteristics during both hot restart and cold start conditions. While I discuss the findings of another E15 study, I'd like to show you a few photos from the engine components after endurance testing to illustrate the results. A similar study conducted by DOE, NREL, and Mercury Marine was completed to investigate the emissions, performance, and durability of running 15% ethanol blend in outboard marine engines during 300 hours of wide open throttle endurance testing, a typical marine engine dur durability cycle. Three separate engine families were evaluated a 9.9 horsepower carbureted four stroke engine and a 300 horsepower supercharged electronic fuel injected four stroke engine represented engines currently in production. A 200 horsepower electronic fuel injected two stroke engine was chosen to represent the legacy products still used wide, widely today. Only one of the engine tested on E15 completed 300 hours without failure. Test results showed poor run quality, including misfires at the end of test, causing an increase in exhaust emissions. In addition, there were increased carbon deposits on the engine, on the underside of the pistons, and on the ends of the connecting rods, clearly exhibiting higher operating temperatures. Additionally, deterioration of the fuel pump gasket was evident, likely due to material compatibility issues with the fuel blend. This deterioration of the gasket could lead to fuel pump failure, disabling the engine. The other two engines tested on E15 catastrophically failed prior to completion of the endurance test. One engine failed a connecting rod and the other failed three exhaust valves. Critical engine components like pistons and connecting rods again documented increased temperatures due to running on E15. E15 does not only deteriorate the engine but also puts the boat fuel systems at risk. While studies have been conducted on E15 in engines, marine fuel tanks and marine lines were never tested or certified for use on anything over E10. Prior to 1990, they were not even certified for E10. Deteriorated fuel lines inside the boats could lead to fuel leakage and a greater risk of fire and explosion. Marine fuel systems prior to 2012 were completely open vented, so E15 would dramatically increase evaporative emissions as ethanol increases fuel validity, volatility, especially if the RVP waiver is allowed. E15 creates a higher probability of phase separation with water in the fuel tank, resulting in greater chance of disabling the boat engines and stranding a boater out on open water. NMMA and the marine industry are not opposed to all ethanol fuel blends. We feel, however, that the RFS is, deeply, is a deeply flawed legislative mandate which is leading this country in a direction that will significantly harm not only marine engines, but other non-road engines and automobiles, and in turn, the consumers of these products. The overwhelming majority of road engines, from chainsaws to reed trimmers to uh, lawnmowers, operate similar to recreational marine engines with open loop fuel systems, including a carburetor that is set at the factory and designed to be and required to be by EPA tamper proof. When the fuel changes in the marketplace and additional oxygenates are added, such as going from E10 to E15, engines run hotter, causing serious dur durability issues and increased emissions, either in the form of increased nitrogen oxides or increased hydrocarbons. The absurdity of it is, by using higher ethanol blends to achieve the mandates of the RFS, we are actually increasing emissions and lowering efficiency. Driven by a mandate rather than sound science, EPA has allowed E15 to be sold in the marketplace, even with documented studies showing durability issues. NMMA is not anti-ethanol, but simply opposed to fuel blends that destroy our engines. For the past five years, NMMA, Mercury Marine, Honda, and the United States Coast Guard, along with the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, Argonne National Labs, BRP Evgrud, have been proactively working to evaluate a better alternative to ethanol, both as an oxygenate and a biofuel. Isobutanol has an energy content closer to that of gasoline, making it more compatible with existing engines and fuel systems. Isobutanol is considered an advanced biofuel in the RFS and can be produced from many different types of biomass feedstock, including corn. NMA has conducted tests on a variety of marine engines and vessels using 16.1% isobutanol by volume, which is similar oxygen content to E10, avoiding the negative properties of E15 identified above. The results of our documented and published research thus far indicate isobutanol at 16.1% volume yields very similar engine emissions, durability, and power as uh, performance as E10. 
NMA supports Congressman Goodlatte's bill, H.R. 704, and believes it takes the appropriate steps to amend the renewable fuel standard by freezing ethanol at E10 and makes other needed changes to assess our biofuel needs. I strongly urge members of this committee to take a serious look at the RFS and move steadfast in reforming this ill-advised mandate. I appreciate the opportunity to come before the committee today and are as happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Uh, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. I'm going to make a couple of comments, too. Uh, I said to some of you all, my dad owned a gas station growing up that he built in 1958 when I was but five years old, an Amico gas station, and he sold Amico white gas that was 100 uh, percent octane and could be used in Coleman lanterns. It was so clean. I own an air conditioning company, so I'm extremely aware of the BTU heat content and energy. And so this is very, very interesting to me. Uh, Mr. Smorch, you addressed this in your written testimony, but uh, can you provide your assessment of the demand? Um, when, you, when you talked about, I, I want you to reiterate Country Mark sales, E0, E10, E15, and E85, you basically said, did you not, that you guys, you have farmers that are uh, owners of the company. Is that right? That is correct. And so, and they they raise corn, some of them. Is that right? That is correct. Would you call that a vested interest? Yes, very okay. much so. Can you address uh, your assessment uh, on the demand for those four categories, E0, 10, 15, and 85? Go back through that one more time for us, would you? Sure. Um, well, first of all, the majority of our gasoline that we sell is E10. We believe that the blend wall is a real limit on how much ethanol can go into gasoline. Um, we have no experience with E15 because E15 is, is more expensive to produce from a refiner standpoint, and so we have, not, we have not gone there. Plus, there's a lot of other issues with E15 um, that are too lengthy to get into. The one thing to reiterate, though, and this is where the EPA, uh, what the EPA is uh, looking at for the renewable fuel standards in 16, is that they're saying that E0 with no ethanol is going to actually have to decrease but we're seeing in our marketplace that E0 is increasing and people are actually requesting to have more E0 available. Um, at the same time, as I said in my testimony, E85 sales are decreasing. Um, and, and well, Why is it? Why don't they want to buy E85? You know, I, I can't tell whether it's, it's energy value or not. All I know is that when we look at the same stations that sell E85 and E10 side by side, people are not choosing to put E85 in their vehicles. So it's market driven. And is, is it true that E85 actually uh, is not as fuel efficient, puts more emissions in the air and it's not as fuel efficient? So in essence, we wind up using more fuel to go the same distance that we would have had we used E10. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in the emission side of it, but mm -hmm. on the energy content, of the E85, it's 25% less energy well, than E10. So you would use, for example, to go, you would use 25, uh, let's say 100 gallons or 125 gallons now. I'm just thinking, if you're going to have to use 125 gallons of the E85 as opposed to the 100 gallons, it's going to put more um, emissions in the air while you're using that extra 25 gallons. In your experience, do you, um, well, let me do this. Does it surprise you that uh, the EPA doesn't even meet the requirements for coming out with a new standard, although they're, they're by law? Uh, would you guys be fined if you didn't meet the new requirements by law? Well, we would, we would have to. Yeah, we would be fined. You would be fined. But no, EPA did not get fined when they didn't meet the requirement uh, of law to come out with that standard, did they? Well, not, not that I'm aware of. No, I, I'm, I'm aware of it. Let me go to all witnesses very quickly. Uh, ten years ago next month, President Bush signed into law an energy bill that in included the renewable fuel standard. The RFS came with lots of promises, including being the answer to achieving energy independence, cleaner air, consumer savings, and even, even defeating terrorism. Um, based on your research and experiences, has RFS achieved these promised benefits? Uh, and, and, it's two parts of the question. Has it achieved these benefits? Let me go back. Energy independence, clean air, consumer savings, and defeating terrorism. It sounds like we've got some negotiation with Iran going on that terrorism hadn't been defeated. Based on your research and your experience, have those four things occurred, Mr. Smorch? I, I would say at this point they probably have not occurred. Dr. Hill? Um, no, they have not. Mr. Red? 
we have not reached that that goal. We're working towards it. Okay, Mr. Reed. My opinion would be no. Would be no. So one of you asked, "Isn't it time for Congress?" And indeed, I said it is to reevaluate the law. So would would y'all agree with that? Just simple yes or no. Isn't it time for Congress to reevaluate that law, Mr. Smorch? Yes, it is. Dr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Red. I'm an expert on renewable fuel generation and technology, so I'm not going to comment on that one. You're not going to comment on that one. You're taking the Fifth Amendment. Is that is that E fifth, E five? <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't know there was order here, but thank you for pointing that out, <laughs> Mr. Reed. Uh, per my testimony, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, and I am going to yield to the ranking member for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Brazil, a third world country, has had an ethanol requirement since 1931. And for the past 40 years, Brazil has had a requirement of E10 or greater. For the past 20 years, it's had a requirement in the neighborhood of E25. Can anyone explain to me why Brazil can do it and we can't? Let's start with you, Mr. Smorch. Um, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not an uh, expert in Brazil and how the interaction between their, their, their gasoline market goes. Well, Mr. Reed, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Brazil has boats, right? Yes, they do. Okay, and lawnmowers. They have lawnmowers, yes. chainsaws. I believe so. So why can Brazil do it and we can't? We know within our marine engines, first of all, when our marine engines go there, we have no warranty because of the fuel requirements. So we drop the warranty. They are not covered under a mercury warranty. The other part of it is we believe they're locally modified to run on this fuel. And the uh, Okay, all right, stop right there. All right, locally modified to run on that fuel. So that's how they deal with it. They get that done. Why couldn't we do the same thing? The, the key thing is that then they have a renewable, a, a consistent fuel source that every day they go to the fuel pumps, they're getting E20. Mm, which is what we should have here, right? The, ch the challenge there is that our customers or our, our consumers of our marine engines can pull up to the gas pump and get anything from E0 to E85, and their uh, chance of misfueling their boat is what's critical. So when it gets down to one choice, they obviously have to pick the one fuel. So, so if, they're view if the renew renewable fuel standards were completely in effect, then you wouldn't have that problem anymore, right? The challenge is, is the variability of the fuel. You know, there's uh, more than enough capability in the marine industry and, and uh, different industries to dial in the engines to the fuel. The key thing is the legacy fleet that's out there is another part of that equation. We can produce going forward just like a number of industries change to adapt to the local fuel or the consistent fuel. Right, and it's probably better to start now than start later. That just makes the problem worse, right? The but let, let me give somebody else a chance. Mr. Red, is there any reason why Brazil can do it and the United States can't? I can't. I can't think of it technology-wise. If, if you know, they're not super geniuses. They have no special laws of physics in Brazil. Nothing like that. Probably worth another look. All right. What about you, Dr. Hill? Any reason why Brazil can do it? Has been doing it for the past 80 years, and we can't. So there have actually been uh, some recent studies that have shown that um, the increased use of ethanol in Brazil has worsened their air quality. Ah. Well, we'll get to that shortly. But you have to answer my question. My question is, is there any reason why Brazil can have an E25 standard for 20 years now and the United States can't? Um, I'm not an expert on ex engine technologies, but I do know Brazil, even though they have two-thirds of the population of the U.S., uses, I believe, about a tenth of the fuel that we use overall. Sounds good to me. So Dr. Hill, now that we're on, mm -hmm. on your subject here, are you aware of scholarly work, research in the industry, that actually contradicts your conclusions? No, I'm not. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, the Renewable Fuel Association has been critical of your perspective on corn. Oh, now you're nodding, so maybe you are aware of oh, this. Uh, that's not. They don't do research. Ah, but let's answer my question, okay? In 2014, they released an analysis that raised questions about your paper. I see you nodding again, saying your conclusions stand at odds. I'm quoting now with real-world data showing decreases in ozone and PM2.5 concentrations, and that there's a substantial body of evidence, I see you nodding some more, proving that ethanol reduces both exhaust hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide emissions, and thus can help to reduce the formation of ground-level ozone. Now this rings a bell? Um, you, well, I was always aware of that, but I did not consider that 
in any way scholarly research. Um, I'm happy to answer both of those points. So the first one, correlation. correlation. Right, let's start with my question. My question is, isn't it fair to say that these studies contradict your conclusions? Those are not studies. They, they it is simply, that is. Results, uh, renewable, what do you want to call them? I mean, now you're quibbling, aren't you? No, no, no. Renewable Fuel Association is a lobbying group. So what they did is they showed, and I'm very aware of their, um, aware of their, um, what they put out in relation to our work. Um, they, um, well, let's wait, talk they about conflated. I have to interrupt okay. because time is short here. The Department of Energy has a model. You agree yes. the Department of Energy is not a lobbying group that is considered to be very good for life cycle emissions analysis, and it highlights that the most recent model from the Department of Energy shows no increase in PM 2.5 emissions or other criteria pollutants when gasoline is 10 percent corn ethanol. That's contradicting your study, and that's the Department of Energy, it's, a rather it's, authoritative We, we actually use Department of Energy results in our study to mm -hmm. come up with our uh, analysis. That is tailpipe emissions. Mm -hmm. Life cycle emissions for corn ethanol are higher than for gasoline when you look at the whole life cycle. That, that's what my testimony was about. Regarding the other point, correlation does not equal causation. Ozone and PM, PM levels have dropped, but that's been due to other interventions in our national infrastructure. Not due to the increased use of ethanol. All right. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm well aware of information that contradicts Dr. Hill's testimony. I'd like permission to put that in the record. Without objection. Does the gentleman yield back? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr. Lattermilk, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is very intriguing. Um, May I add that there are some significant differences between the United States and Brazil, and I think one of those is called freedom and consumer choice, which uh, – I think is one of the reasons why we have far exceeded a lot of other countries like Brazil. And, in fact, that's what our founders envisioned in this nation, was to let the people uh, be ultimately in control of their choices. I'm sure that as we study food products, as I'm often reminded in my home, that my choices of food are probably not the best for my health. Uh, we could take the Brazil model with food and have the government dictate that we all eat a spinach salad every meal. Um, but let's, I don't let's think not the go too people, far now. I don't, I don't think the American people are going to go that route. Uh, second of all, I was very intrigued in the answers that you weren't able to give because I'm very interested in facts here. I'm not trying to uh, justify a wrong that may have already occurred. I, want, I would really like to hear what your response would have been uh, to the gentleman from Florida if, if you were allowed to continue on with, uh, with, with your response to the report. I may uh, add uh, or define the, uh, what the lobbying group came up with versus your uh, research. Thank you for the additional time to talk about this. Um, we, we've long experienced um, uh, interactions with the Renewable Fuel Association. In fact, one time they put out a report, uh, a response to a previous paper of mine, uh, that they actually um, uh, copied three quarters of it from something that had been published ten years earlier. So, the, um, rega with regard to that particular um, um, response to our work in December. Um, they put a graph that showed decreasing ozone levels and PM levels over time in the U.S. Um, along, uh, in, and also showed increase in ozone levels. Well, you can also um, show all sorts of other correlations that exist. In fact, I encourage people to go to spuriouscorrelations.com, I believe. If you Google it, it's on there. It shows ridiculous things, um, uh, increasing levels of pirates and, and uh, um, um, changes in dietary patterns, for instance. Um, this is the same level of ridiculousness that um, was involved in this uh, correlation uh, that Renewable Fuel Association showed in that report. Uh, so, and the other point is that the, um, the, the emissions of PM are very similar when you burn ethanol compared to gasoline. It might even be slightly lower in some cases, but that doesn't change all the emissions that occur as a result of producing the fuels. And in producing the fuels, the emissions are much higher when you, um, uh, uh, for ethanol than they are for gasoline. So tailpipe, about the same. Producing the fuels much higher for ethanol, in some much worse for ethanol than for gasoline. So put this in layman terms, you're looking at the life cycle from when the, the, the corn seed's put in the ground to where it's burned and the emissions come out the tailpipe. The pollutants are greater in that entire life cycle as compared to the entire life cycle from when we drill 
and we extract the oil. We either import the oil or domestically refine it uh, till the emissions come out of the tailpipe. What I'm understanding you say is there are more air pollutants in that life cycle with ethanol-based fuel than it is uh, pure gasoline. Ethanol from corn, yes, and for pollutants that affect fine particulate matter formation in the atmosphere and ozone formation, yes. Okay. To err is human, to forgive is divine, but the definition of insanity is once you err, you keep erring over and over and over again. Um, we may have had a great idea with the renewable fuel standards. It, it sparked innovation to go down a, a, a path. Um, Mr. Smorch, in, in your, the realm you're in is very interesting because I'm sure, um, and you can answer, answer this, your suppliers uh, benefited financially from a renewable fuel standard because it created a market that didn't exist. Is that true? Well, our, 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 our customers, yes. I mean, we're, yep. we purchase you, oil and we, we, we refine it. Right. Um, but to the point now, because it hasn't gone the path that we expected it to go, it now is you have a deplenishing market. Is that right? You're, you're being forced to produce something that you can't sell, at least in the percentage that, you, that your market demands. Yes. We're, I'm, it, we, we are comfortable with, with selling gasoline that has 10% ethanol in it. But once you get the higher, higher percentages of ethanol, it, the customer, it, it appears that the customer does not want that product. Okay. And, Dr. Hill, obviously you have no uh, – uh, financial advantage one way or the other, if, whether it produces a market or not. You're purely coming from just pure scientific. My work research. has not been sponsored by anybody except for federal competitive grants. Okay. Um, this is very intriguing, but I see that I'm out of time, so, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And, and just to clear the record and clear uh, Brazil, uh, it is neither a third world country or a dictatorship. Just, you know, didn't think we'd have to start the hearing uh, clearing that up. But uh, for Mr. Reed, um, Mr. Reed, do you agree that only about 1% of the fuel consumption uh, in the United States uh, is for uh, recreational boats? I'm not aware of the data behind that. I'm really uh, here to testify on the effects of E15. Okay. The, the data I'm familiar with is that uh, in 2012 and every year uh, since, that recreational boats consumed about 1.6 billion gallons of gas, which represents about 1 percent of the fuel consumption, uh, and that it's been pretty typical since then. So would you agree that, you know, to condemn an entire law or standard based on uh, a population that is only 1 percent uh, of fuel consumption uh, may be going uh, too far or perhaps throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Well, from, from my perspective, you know, the study was conducted on E15 to show the detrimental results to that. I think the key thing there is we're looking at our, our legacy fee fleet that's recognized to be 40 years old. Of that, there's 12 million boaters, boats in the U.S. So while it may be small in percentile, it's affecting many people. Sure. But most boaters would have uh, the option of using uh, E10, isn't that right? If, if they're at a fuel station, uh, there's E15. They're supposed to be uh, E10, which uh, would not cause the problems you've described. Correct. E10 will not cause issues. Our engines are certified and uh, validated on E10. So are, are you familiar with stations that are only serving E15 and not giving the E10 option uh, to boaters? I'm not aware of the distribution of... Uh, one particular fuel only at, at a gas station. I think there is a distribution of fuel, E0, E10, E15, E85. Um, I, I think the key thing there is uh, the education and a knowledge when a person pulls up to the pump. Are they selecting the proper grade? Are they grabbing a hose that's available? Are they looking at the price? That's not really my technical background or my background, but the key thing is that they select the correct yeah. one. Misfueling is definitely high potential. So you would agree, though, that maybe perhaps instead of changing uh, the, the fuel standards and education campaign uh, from your industry and perhaps even from government uh, may also assist in correcting this issue? I'm not an expert in the social and the ability to, to educate consumers to that level of detail, but what I can tell you is E15 and boat engines will cause, cause issues. Sure. 
Mr. Red, uh, as we've – and thank you to each of you for uh, appearing today. Uh, as we've heard today, one of the central concerns regarding ethanol blends uh, is, is the blend wall concept and how to advance drop in biofuels get over uh, this purported, purported uh, hurdle. And if you could speak to uh, how your company's work advances the prospect of integrating biofuels into the transportation fuel supply. Thank you. Um, we, we have been working on this for nine years, and our, our focus from the very beginning was how can we do things without subsidies? How can we, you know, bring biofuels to a point where it can stand on its own, where, where it can contribute, you know, lower greenhouse gas emissions, lower emissions, and, and some energy security uh, to our country by, by not – and do it without subsidies. Um, Standing up a new technology, standing up new infrastructure against an industry that's been here for 100 years plus is challenging, and 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 in, in, in a uh, an industry that controls the distribution and sale of fuels, um, you know that that is that is what we're up against with our technology, and so what you know our our focus has been on taking low cost feedstocks converting them into 100 percent drop-in fuels and then providing that technology to folks who are who are interested in making renewable fuels and, and just a yes or no for either for each witness uh, because there is not a representative here from uh, the biofuels uh, industry uh, as far as the additive side do you think it would have been more helpful to also hear from that perspective mr. smart I thought mr. red is from the biofuels well he's on the drop-in side right mr. Red? Yeah, we're not doing ethanol or biodiesel. We're doing 100% drop-ins that, that look and perform like petroleum. And there's a difference between drop-in and additive, right? 100% drop-in fuel can be used without blending with petroleum and, and has the same performance or, or, you know, as, as petroleum. So, you know, when, when you look at the additives, ethanol is not burned at 100% for a reason. You know, biodiesel is not burned at 100% for a reason. Our, our fuels are, are, are quite different from those. Do you think it would have been helpful, Dr. Hill, to hear from the ethanol uh, industry? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> hey, we appreciate honesty here. And uh, Mr. Reed? Um, my, per my, my perspective was based on our test data. Uh, if you, the committee, needed to, to have that perspective, then that would have been beneficial. It's really up to you. Great. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our witnesses. Now yield back. I thank you, the gentleman for yielding back. I recognize the gentleman from Kentucky. Mr. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. So in my district, consumers, um, at least anecdotally, are, are relating that they get less gas mileage from blended fuels than they do from uh, uh, petroleum um, that's not blended with ethanol. And what I want to clear up here today, because as recently as last week, a lobbyist for the ethanol industry tried to convince me that mileage was the same whether uh, you had pure petroleum-based products or one that was blended with ethanol. So I'd like to ask each of the four of you, is, is the mileage the same with, from a, a gallon of gasoline versus a, uh, a gallon of gasoline that's blended, been blended 10 percent or 85 percent or 15 percent with ethanol? Mr. Smorch. Ethanol only has about 67 percent of the energy content per gallon than a pure petroleum gasoline. So when you have a blended gasoline with, with gasoline and ethanol, the mileage will decrease as more ethanol is included in that blend. And uh, Dr. Hill? Uh, I'm not an expert on, in that area, but it is a complicated question because you also have an oxygen at boost with ethanol. And so at some levels, in some vehicle technologies, it, you may have the same mileage. You may also have a drop in other um, cases. If you blend at high levels like E85, you will, of course, um, require more fuel to go the same distance, but you will also pay less at the pump. Mr. Red. Not an expert in ethanol, but I'll tell you our fuels will meet or exceed petroleum. Um, Mr. E Reese. In the marine industry, you will get worse fuel economy with E10. Um, and, Mr. Reed, you're a, the director of engine design at Mercury Marine. I was hoping maybe you could explain to me, this is a little bit out of your field, but related to engine design, why are the motorcyclists in my district so opposed to ethanol blends? Uh, I, I would only be speculating if I answered that question. Well, it, please it, do okay. in, in the context of their engine since you're director well, of engine I, design. I, I believe that's very similar to uh, the perspective on the, in the marine side. 
people uh, I've seen on forums discussing with customers directly, they will go to particular marinas that have what's called the REC 90. It's a 90 octane, zero ethanol uh, fuel. Um, I think they know they have more comfort level with a zero ethanol uh, fuel that it'll burn, it'll have less likelihood of having interaction in their fuel system, less potential for, for uh, water separation in their fuel system and the issues associated with that. You can only assume the motorcycle people think the same. Um, Mr. Smorch, uh, again, I received some information from lobbyists last week that perhaps the reason ethanol wasn't selling well at the fuel stations was there was some sort of conspiracy among the oil and petroleum manufacturers and distributors that they didn't want to provide it to customers. Yet I see signs in my district at the gas pumps that say our gas is ethanol free. Now, uh, that seems to be a consumer question that comes up. Can you speak to consumer demand for ethanol and whether this is a conspiracy of the petroleum retailers? Um, I, well, I can, I can speak uh, our experience. We're a supply cooperative, and what we do is we sell wholesale to our member companies, and they're the ones that actually retail the product. Um, we sell and we supply to them what they ask us to supply, whether it's gasoline with E10, we supply E85 to them, we supply E0 to them. So we're not conspiring, conspiring to not allow ethanol or higher ethanol blends to be out in the marketplace, but when you look at the data that we have and our experience, higher ethanol blends like E85, they just do not sell as much as an E0 or an E10 would. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hill, in your estimation, should corn ethanol be classified as a green fuel given its environmental impact? Um, the only thing green about it is the plant that it comes from. <laughs> uh, now, your findings would seem to find some support in a study released last year that ozone levels in Brazil actually have uh, increased as ethanol usage did. Is that true? Um, I will need to go back and review that, if that study was released last year or not, but I believe that studies have come out that have shown worsening air quality in Brazil as the use of ethanol use. And um, does the EPA's regulatory impact analysis reach similar conclusions that you do? I understand that EPA's triennial review uh, in that they also found diminished air quality, water quality, biodiversity, and a number of other environmental impacts as a re result of increased corn ethanol use. I was on the review panel for the triennial review, and the triennial review said that biofuels could be produced in ways that are better than gasoline, and it said that they could be produced in ways that are worse than gasoline. It didn't specify whether the fuels produced from RFS2 are necessarily better or worse than gasoline or thank, diesel. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and um, to the panel, thank you for being here today. I don't really have a dog in this fight. I represent the suburbs of Denver. And, you know, uh, Mr. Massey asked some questions about uh, gas mileage. I think uh, from my point of view, we've seen that blended uh, fuels have a little less uh, uh, mileage per gallon than uh, straight petroleum. But I'm not coming at it so much uh, from the... Um, emission standpoint as just a menu of fuels to be available to Americans, uh, whether it's um, a blended fuel or a straight replacement or electricity or hydrogen fusion. I mean, all of these would have some impact on how you b make an engine, right? Absolutely. I mean, each kind of these fuels, you, you may have to alter the engines you guys would have to build, it, whether it's boats or cars or motorcycles, right? Other than if they're classified as drop-in. Okay, so drop-in is what Mr. Red's company uh, makes, and that's just a, a complete replacement equal to equal. Correct. Or better in your estimation, sir, Mr. Red. Emissions-wise, it, it certainly is. Okay. So, Dr. Hill, I would assume as a, as a scientist, you wouldn't have any opposition to the fact that we're looking for, and this country is trying out different kinds of fuels, would you? Trying out different fuels is a wonderful thing, but you need to look very carefully whether you go whole hog into them. 
And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, right now, we produce about 15 billion gallons a year of ethanol. Um, if we were to increase our fuel efficiency of our fleet by average by one mile per gallon, we would do as much for reducing petroleum use as producing that 15 billion gallons of fuel. So the direction you want to go is fuel efficiency and conservation and electrification rather than necessarily trying out all these fuels over the whole fleet. For some applications like aerospace, yes, that is a good option to consider because we really don't have other options. And that's the point. We want to have options. You don't want to be so married or so wedded to a particular fuel that if, in fact, there's some kind of uh, embargo, all of a sudden you're in trouble until we come up with something else. And so from my point of view, I want to have a menu of opportunities. I think politically there has been a push for corn-based types of fuels. And in Colorado we have some corn. That's not a, you know, a main product for us. I would I think Minnesota probably has a pretty good corn crop. Very healthy corn. You know, in Iowa and sort of the center of the country. So there's been a lot of politics driving this as well as potentially maybe some emissions help. You know, certainly having an additional type of fuel to keep us as independent as possible and not subject to, you know, some kind of dictator's whim someplace on the planet. So do, you know, what I do have in my district is the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is looking at cellulosic and all kinds of different fuels, from the fusion we talked about to better ways to burn the gasoline to whatever. So, Mr. Smorch, I mean, you don't have a problem with us as, as a general proposition. And, and I, I appreciate Dr. Hill's point of view. You don't want to go whole hog if you don't have to. You know, if, but you don't have a problem with us testing out different kinds of fuels, do you? No, from a testing standpoint, there's no problem with that. But when the realities of the marketplace and getting it to the end consumer, that is where the challenge is. So at the petrol, at the gas station, though, if, we, if we're providing different kinds of fuels, then you've got to come up with different kinds of gas pumps, right, or some, some type of delivery system for a particular type of fuel. Correct. So if we're doing natural gas, we've got to have some kind of natural gas. If we're going to do electricity, somebody's got to have a good plug-in. Likewise, if we're doing E85, it's got to be a certain kind of mix. If we're doing a drop-in, and I don't know, Mr. Red, do you have pumps in Colorado that are your, your particular type of fuel? We are just moving to commercial scale. We have four licensees. Two of them are in engineering now and building full-scale commercial facilities. So we, we are not at commercial scale yet. Mr. Reed, I would expect that as ideas or these different fuels come up, your company you know, pl plays with modifying its engines from time to time just to, to make sure you could do it if you had to. Through, through the DOE funding, we've looked at the E15. We've done that study in addition to uh, uh, the isobutanol study with the U.S. Coast Guard. So as uh, they f firm up and, and have support, we will get involved to understand their effect on the engine and, and then deal with the data that, that is uh, supported within that study. Okay, thank you, and thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Knight, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I appreciate the stop in the uh, Brazil back and forth, uh, Mr. Perlmutter. Thank you for uh, doing that because uh, I was going to not make a Brazil comment so that we could stop on that. Uh, Mr. Smorch, I'd like a couple uh, answers. Um, a couple of the questions that went back and forth were on what the customer wants. And I think one of the last uh, questions was testing is okay. Give me an idea on testing on new uh, petroleum, new um, ways of fueling our cars is okay, but when the government gets involved and says, now we've got to do this, you've got to, we are going to push this type of uh, a fuel source, give us an idea of, of the difference there between testing new, um, new fuels and actually making the customer have that choice or making the customer do this. I mean, doing, Countrymark's not involved with doing a lot of research and development on fuels, but going and in, 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 in for independent people to go and find a different fuel source, that's fine. The reality of it is is that 
when you when you put in just take gasoline gasoline is everybody thinks that it's gasoline and ethanol really there's 30 different things that go into gasoline it's a complex recipe and what we do as refiners is we're trying to optimize what that recipe looks like so if there is other economical streams that could get into gasoline that'd be great because we that's what we're trying to do to be able to provide the customer the best fuel and do it economically okay so now let me go to uh, mr reed you showed us this study of 300 hours of uh of these three different types of engines working with three different types of fuel sources can you give us an idea did the did the test go any further to show that uh, if I run these fuels for such a period of time and the engine does make it, how much it's going to cost me to, to correct the engine problems, how much it's going to cost me to fix it over the life of the engine, those types of things. And whenever you buy a car, it'll give you that little, that little number there that says the cost to run this car for a year. Um, and whatever that might be, $1,200 or, or something like that. Did you do any further testing on, on the engines? Well, within the engine that did survive the E15 study, uh, the 99 horsepower, we did complete emissions and uh, testing on that, performance testing. It did deteriorate from an emission standpoint. So that testing was done. We did not look at the economics of necessarily in depth of what it would cost to run that fuel versus a different fuel, add in repairs at the end, or purchasing a new, new engine. Um, but I can tell you that the other two engines that uh, had failed catastrophically failed would have been a brand new engine it would have been thousands of dollars to replace at that point in time okay so safe to say that I would be getting less uh, hours or less MPG I guess uh, it would be hours on a on a boat uh, engine yes. and it would cost me more because I'd have to repair the engine in, in the end yes okay mr. red can you give me an idea on how uh, what the Navy is uh, feeling about the new drop-in fuel um, I think the Navy's excited about it. Um, Secretary Mabus, for the last several years, has said, you know, 50% is great, but I'm looking for 100% replacement. They're looking for it from a strategic energy, uh, energy security uh, point of view. If, if they're cut off from petroleum fuels, then they have no ability to fight a war. And if a fuel requires blending with petroleum and you're cut off from petroleum, you, you know, you still can't use it. So I think that they've wanted the option of being able to, to blend at any, any rate they want to. And um, and that's why you know they're they're choosing to look at our fuel. The performance is important too. If you get a performance boost with our fuel on a combat radius on an F-18 that otherwise is kind of combat limited, not like a Tomcat that had a lot of fuel. F-18 is kind of limited on fuel, so the Navy needs as much combat radius, needs as much miles in that F-18 tank of fuel as they can get. So so they're looking for fuels that are efficient. Um, but you know I think that's that's the two reasons they're looking for it is is one energy security. You know this can be you know, in plants built around the world, we're looking at a lot of licensees in a lot of places around the world where the Navy operates that can build these plants, India and, and, and other other places. Um, and so the Navy wants to be able to buy these fuels in different places and, and you know, blend them at any rate. Okay. And the, are the other services looking at this too? The Navy is the lead dog on, on renewable fuels. The Air Force did a lot of work. Through um, you know for the la over the last seven or eight years, but right now the Navy is leading leading the charge on renewable fuels, and the Army and the Air Force are are, are taking their results and and looking at what they're going to do with those fuels. The Army is buying about 3,000 gallons of our fuel to test alongside looking at the Navy Navy results and are going to use our fuel as well. Okay. Um, so they're they're pretty much taking those results and are and are going to look at certifying it for their their platforms. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Mr. Lubinsky, you recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> We're at an uh, interesting point in the development of uh, ethanol capacity where second generation of ethanol plants using cellulosic feedstock are starting to come online. I think uh, it's a really exciting development as it demonstrates a successful technological development that can reduce our dependence on corn feedstock for fuel, can make beneficial economic economic use out of what was formerly corn and agricultural waste and even trash. It can develop fuel with even less environmental consequences than corn ethanol. Other advanced biofuels are also starting to come online and hold promise. So I think this is something we should all be, be celebrating. However, we only have three such plants online right now, and seeking financial commitments for future development depends on smart RFS policy and market signals that encourage investment. 
Dr. Hill, in your testimony, you note that potential environmental benefits of cellulosic ethanol over corn ethanol as well as gasoline. So we'll start with, uh, with Dr. Hill. Anyone else can, uh, uh, can, can join in here. Uh, how do you think we arrive at a point where more second generation capacity can be invested in and developed, moving us beyond corn ethanol? And how do you see cellulosic ethanol and other advanced biofuels competitively moving ahead if the current RFSF is held up? So RFS to date has largely been satisfied by um, corn and soy. And to move to next generation, next generation sources, we need to look not only at RFS um, and, of course, very strong market signals that it can provide, uh, but we even need to look into ag policy. I mean, it would be interesting to, to, to talk about that at some point. And we right now have very um, strong signals and support for the growth of annual row crops, corn and soy. Uh, such as uh, subsidies for insurance. No, sub no such subsidies exist for many of these second generation fuel feedstocks such as, um, uh, such as uh, lignocellulosic sources like switchgrass, miscanthus, and others that could produce fuels potentially better than our current um, conventional fuels. So one thing that would need to be um, largely changed would be to provide that sort of incentive to farmers to switch away from annual row crops to perennial crops that can provide much better life cycle um, benefits than first generation fuels. Anyone else have any? Anything? If not, I'll, I'll move on to uh, uh, Mr. Reed. Uh, now, I, I understand the, as, as you discuss the uh, challenges of using certain ethanol blends in smaller engines, such as boats and motorcycles. However, it's my understanding that most everywhere that any ethanol blend is sold, there is also there will also be E10 fuels available that are not injurious to boat or other small engines. So I'm trying to understand the marine industry's concerns about ethanol and RSF if safe gasoline options are widely available. Am I wrong that E10 is widely available, or are there marinas or gas stations that are selling only selling E15 or above blends? Uh, can you explain uh, more your concerns about safe fuel availability? It really comes down to if the consumers are given choices at the pump with many pumps not clearly identified. Our concern is that, and the data shows that if they do run E15, it will be detrimental to their engine life in addition to their boat fuel systems. So that's really outside my wheelhouse of talking about the, the market and how to ensure that they don't do this. but the, effects if they do have a mistake are, are very detrimental. So might this be more of an education issue rather than a, a matter of, of the RFS? I believe the uh, National Marine uh, Manufacturer Association would be better uh, prepared to discuss that and they could f provide you information on that. That's really not my expertise. Okay. It just seems to me that uh, it's, it's not a situation where it's not available. It's that mistakes could be, could be made. Um, uh, and using the wrong, uh, wrong fuel, and I understand the uh, uh, the problems that that, that causes. But uh, I think that maybe that's more of the issue: education, um, making clear at the pumps what what is available there, what everything is, uh, rather than the uh, than the RFS. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Bill Posey out of Florida is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this hearing and, and bringing these uh, great witnesses in here. Uh, and, and I hope if we have any more, we also might have uh, representatives from some organizations that uh, represent literally uh, the concerns of millions of other Americans, and I'm talking about uh, SEMA, the Specialty Equipment uh, Marketing Association, the uh, AMA, the American Motorcycle Association, uh, the Antique Automobile Club of America, uh, and, and, and many other groups that, that have uh, had their members suffer uh, since the introduction of uh, corn into their gas tanks. Uh, I'd like to ask each, each member of the panel just their opinion, uh, yes or no, if you could, uh, if you agree with this statement. The greater the amount of ethanol added to gasoline, the less efficient the gasoline is. As I said earlier, as you add more ethanol into gasoline, the energy content does decrease. So that's a yes. So yes. Yeah. We, 
One word. I cannot do it in one word. You can't. Yeah, so you. All right. That's because, okay. It, it, it may or may not affect fuel economy. It depends on the technology that's used to. Uh, I didn't talk about fuel economy. I talked about efficiency. Efficiency is a function of the fuel and the technology. Yes, that burns yes. It. The, the, basically, the more corn you stick in gasoline, the less efficient it is. That is not necessarily so. Okay. Next. I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that one. That's not my expertise. In, in the marine engines, yes. Okay. Um, agree with this statement, yes or no? Uh, there are more pollutants in the total life cycle of ethanol than gasoline. I'm not qualified to answer that one. There are many pollutants for the ones that affect air quality and climate change, yes. That's not my expertise. I'm not qualified to answer that question. Okay. Uh, in your testimony, Mr. Reed, uh, you outlined the research conducted by Mercury Marine in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, can you summarize the conclusions of that research on the impact of broad use of E15? Uh, broad use of E15 will uh, be detrimental to our customers' engines from the standpoint of, as I showed in the pictures, uh, long-term durability issues. Uh, we showed... Uh, increased temperatures in addition to compatibility issues with the fuel system that could lead to leaks in addition to the boat. And the key thing there is, is our legacy fleet is 40 years old. Uh, some of those fuels were designed and developed on leaded fuel, some of those engines. So you can see that uh, they're going to be highly challenged by going to higher, higher ethanol blends. And destroy the seals in every carburetor. Their, their incompatibility, will, we will find those, uh, yes. Okay. Um, what were the impacts of E15 on durability, emissions, and run quality, bottom line? Uh, it was deteriorated. They were worse with the E15 than E0 gasoline. Okay. And what is the impact of mid-level ethanol blends on marine engine performance? Could you define mid-level? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, E10 plus? Some, yes, E10 plus. E10 plus will be similar results to RE15. Uh, it'll just be accelerated. The failures will occur, occur faster if it's above E15 uh, than what was shown in our study. Okay. And uh, any thoughts about the uh, uh, human safety, environmental, and technological concerns associated with ethanol blends over 10% in recreational boat fuel tanks and engines? I think the, the key thing is... Uh, when you get stranded out on open water, be it a very large lake or the ocean, there is no tow truck that can come get you. It's a, it's a challenge and it's fearful. That's why our boating community has twins, or at least two engines on their back of their boat, redundant systems similar to an airplane. So when they do go offshore, they can get back. So our concerns would be around people getting stranded and, and that potential risk, in addition to, as I outlined in my, outlined in my testimony, uh, older fuel system in the boats were not certified for anything above E10. Okay. And what are the potential impacts of widespread sales of E15 on the boating industry? From the standpoint, uh, the, the data supports that uh, the engines will be at risk from a durability standpoint. Um, I can't tell you uh, if those people that lose engines, that, that their engines fail, are going to turn around and buy new products or they're going to get out of boating. Uh, one thing about boating is that uh, it, it uh, can be challenging at times to get to the water and enjoy the day. And uh, we certainly don't want our consumers turning around and say, that's not right, that's not where I want to spend my time, I'm going to go elsewhere. So uh, we work very hard in the marine industry to make boating very easy. We add additional technologies where required to help the boater out to have an enjoyable day so that when they're on the water with their family, uh, it, it, it's a, it turns out to be an excellent day. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. With Mr. Perlmutter's permission, we're going to go for a second round to violate these witnesses' rights. So I'm um, chair, chair now <laughs> recognizes Mr. Grayson of Florida. You have the right to remain silent. <laughs> Anything that you say can and will be used against you. I'm talking to you, Dr. Hill. <laughs> Dr. Hill, has the renewable fuel standard increased or decreased carbon dioxide emissions? 
the renewable fuel standard has increased net greenhouse gas emissions. Increased on a lifestyle basis? Yes, it has. But, but uh, not on a sort of spot basis, if you will, not in terms of what's coming out of the tailpipe. In terms of, you can't look just at the terms of the tailpipe in terms of the impact of those fuels. Well, you could. You just don't want you, to. You could. It, Let's you'd, be honest. You'd, be missing the, you'd be missing the point. All right. Uh, and th th this conclusion that you've reached, that refers only to corn-based ethanol, correct? Actually, it's a bigger problem than that. Uh, so some recent work has come out that has looked at the fuel market rebound effect of uh, these fuels. And so when you add more fuels into the system, essentially you mandate the addition of um, uh, production of renewable fuels, uh, you, in you increase overall fuel use. And the latest work that has come out has showed that using, producing um, an additional gallon of biofuel uh, only reduces use of conventional fuels by about half a gallon. So you have to be much better off in terms of net greenhouse gas emissions to reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, you have to be 50 percent better as a renewable fuel than gasoline to even break even in terms of net greenhouse gas emissions. All right. But the studies that you've done personally, they're based upon corn-based ethanol, correct? We've done corn ethanol. We've done cellulosic ethanol from switchgrass, from um, Stover, from many other feedstocks as well. You've done sugar cane? Uh, we have not done sugar cane. Or what about the fuel that, uh, that Mr. Red referred to? You haven't done anything on that, right? He has a drop-in fuel, and the conversion proce process is very efficient, but it requires feedstocks. It requires some sort of, uh, some sort of oil uh, feedstock, and, and he can speak more about, about uh, the requirements for those feedstocks. And as I described in my testimony, many of the impacts occur in the production of the feedstocks, not in the conversion or even the tailpipe. And so what the net greenhouse gas impacts of his fuels will depend largely on what happens in producing those feedstocks, as well as the fuel market rebound effects in terms of consumer use of these fuels. And Mr. Red also referred to the possibility of algae-based ethanol and so on. You've done no studies on algae-based ethanol. Actually, we have. We published a major study in environmental science and technology uh, last, um, I believe it was last September, where we looked at algal feedstocks from a number of different sources using a number of different technologies, evaluated over a number of different environmental impacts. And we showed that the only way that you'll have algal feedstocks that will be better than um, current fuel options is when you tie them to um, uh, wastewater treatment uh, processes. You essentially can clean up the water at the same time as you're producing algal fuels. Now, they may be incredibly expensive to produce, but they could potentially be better if done in the right way. Uh, in general, all, all that we've been discussing, all these different options, they could be done in the right way, right? There's no natural barrier to having a biofuel that, is, that produces less greenhouse gases than the alternative, which is fossil fuels, right? You can do it, but it may be incredibly expensive, and your dollar may be much better spent if you're looking to reduce environmental impacts, as we all are, uh, to go for efficiency or conservation or simply pay people to drive less. That would be a better option than some of these fuels. Mr. Wright, give us some idea of the future of ethanol as you see it. Uh, how will ethanol be produced five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now? How will it be produced? From the, what? The future of ethanol or, yeah. or, or other alternative fuels? Well, let's start with ethanol. Um, I think, you know, there, there are several ways of doing it. They do it from algae. There are, al there are alcohol processes that produce, al that produce ethanol. There's cellulosic technology, and they're commercialized, and they're doing it cellulosically from, from different cellulosic feedstocks. And then there's traditional corn that's, I think, it's going to be around for a while due to the political nature of this country. And what about alternative fuels more generally for transportation purposes only because that's what we're talking about today? The other alternative fuels? I, I think that there's been a big shift towards how can we take waste feedstocks that are, that are not used, you know, efficiently now, how can we turn those into, into great fuels? Um, brown grease is a, is a, you know, it's land applied. It it's goes into landfills. It goes into water treatment. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, people are trying to get rid of it. If we can take that and turn that into 100% drop-in diesel and jet fuel, that's a big win. 
um, taking taking used cooking oil, you know, and, and turning that. You know, there, there's there are lots of different feedstocks out there that we can turn into. You know, so it's, it's a matter of finding these different streams of feedstocks and turning them into efficiently into 100% drop-in fuels for us. Um, but they're you know we're not the only ones. You know, ARA and, and Chevron Lumis Global are doing it, but Shell Environment are doing it. There are a bunch of other second-generation uh, com- you know companies that are based on the RFS and the, and the supports of the RFS going out there and introducing new, new technologies to take different feedstocks and efficiently turn them in. And, and it's all based on the, the efficiency, the, the greenhouse gas emissions and reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. You know, nobody's, going to, nobody's going after first generation, you know, 10 or 20 percent better than petroleum. Most, or or if, you say, if, if what he's saying is right, you know, a negative, most everybody's going after a 50 to 80, 90 percent, you know, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. That's what second generation is looking for. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding back, and um, the chair recognizes himself. Mr. Red, um, you all produced jet fuel for the Navy, and uh, you may be interested to know that in, in our district there in Texas, on the Gulf Coast, my district... Uh, produces 60% of the nation's jet fuel, obviously from a bit more traditional sources. Um, what was the, What's your cost as compared to regular, what we would say, tr- conventional jet fuel? On commercial scale, we're going to be very competitive, and, and you know, 80% of it is going to be the cost of the feedstock. If you start with a brown grease, you're at 10 cents a pound, 80 cents a gallon. That's pretty competitive going against you know, petroleum even below 50 bucks a barrel. Um, so if 80% of our feedstock, you know, 80% of our cost is feedstocks, commercially we're going to be very competitive. Our conversion technology is competitive with petroleum refining. Right, let's put that into dollars and cents for us lay people. So if, if a gallon of jet fuel is three bucks, what's y'all's cost? Um, at commercial scale, with with waste feedstocks, it'll be it'll be cost competitive. It'll be right there at the, at, the, at the cost of so uh, that's petroleum. that's your aim, but that's somewhere down the road, quite a, quite a ways. Yet. Certainly, certainly, that, okay. that's at commercial scale. Okay. Uh, uh, let's go back to algae, algal, uh, biofuel. When I was in the Texas legislature, I was on the Environmental Reg Committee and a member of the Energy Council. Uh, it was 11 energy producing states, four Canadian provinces, and that other state, that other uh, country, Venezuela. Yeah. And we met around the country, uh, and we'd had discussions about best energy practices and legislation, so on and so forth. We were talking about algal. We had somebody come in and talk to us about algal fuel, and the Canadian Minister, Minister of Energy, I think I've got his title correct, said it would never work in Canada. And, and Mr. Smorch, you kind of refer to the, the cold part of the year here, uh, because in Canada the weather was so severe most of the time that they couldn't grow enough algae for that for it to be cost efficient. Somebody popped up in the so they they hadn't figured out how to grow enough of it because of the climate. And, some I popped up in the back said, "If you'll make it illegal, the marijuana growers will figure out how to how to grow it." Um, but Mr. Smorch, you actually mentioned this as being part of in your testimony that even in your district, in your area, I should say, how many months was it uh, unrealistic to use the 15 percent, or was it the 85 percent? No, it, it was actually biodiesel. Right. Oh, the and, biodiesel. Yeah, it was in the biodiesel, and it was in my written testimony. Is that just the the way biodiesel is? It'll start gelling at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty substantial right portion so, of your winter. So our members will not buy biodiesel from November through uh, middle of March, April 1st. They just won't. They won't buy it in their diesel fuel. Wow. Okay. Uh, continuing with you, Mr. Smorse, the EPA has indicated that the sale of EO will eventually cease as refiners work to comply with the RFS. Now, your website, Company Mark's website, shows that you have 16 stations currently offering EO within a 100-mile radius of Indianapolis. So if the refining of EO eventually ceases, what does that do to those operations? I, I, I know that the EPA... It probably says that that, that uh, E zero has to go to nothing, but I, I think in our marketplace, there, where it's available, we'll, the customer is going to demand that E zero is there, and so we'll we will continue to supply it to our members. Okay, let's jump over to you, uh, Mr. Reed. Uh, I told you my dad had a gas station. He had boat sheds, and I've seen those Evan Roods. I know that's a bad term, bad word around you all, Mercury's and others. Uh, where they would fill up their boats and they'd go out. Uh, and you all may know this, you may not. So you tested your engines for 300 hours on your boat motors. What does the average boater, uh, I'm assuming they use their boat on the weekends, do you have an hour number? To, are they out? Do they run that motor five hours a weekend, ten hours a weekend? 
it's typical that uh, an average customer in the United States will run their boat less than 50 hours a year. But the key thing there is that same boat engine will also go to government sales. It'll go to taxi fleet. Sure. So our distribution of hours per year is profound. 50 hours a year, typical customer. Okay. Dr. Hill, uh, you keep talking about switchgrass, and, and this uh, this kind of is interesting to me. Uh, there's talk about cellulostic, um, and that would be the grass and yard clippings and so on and so forth. Uh, Switchgrass is not just the grass. Is that the grass you just see growing up along the highways? What is switchgrass? You do in some areas. So switchgrass is a native um, uh, perennial grass to much of the Midwest and eastern United States. Okay. You'll see it in common prairie and grass. It, is it the same type of prairie grass? My dad also was in the hay business before he started his, air, his uh, gas station business. Is it the same kind of prairie grass that we bale and feed the cattle? It may have been. Um, depends on, on where your farm was. Um, but switchgrass is one of the major components of the typical American prairie, big blue stem, little blue stem, uh, switchgrass, and others. So it is a native plant, and there's been a lot of interest in using it um, as a feedstock. I'm involved with a group uh, called Sen USA. It's a $25 million grant from USA specifically to look at the production of fuels uh, from switchgrass. So in that instance, you would say that those hay balers who make hay now for, for stock, for whether it's horses or cattle or whatever, uh, in some instances may change from baling hay to supply the cattle industry, as it were, uh, to now the fuel industry, if that becomes a widespread practice. It's really no different. We've baled hay for many, many years, uh, many, many centuries, if not millennia. And, uh, and so using what we've learned in that production for biofuels has a lot of potential. You can produce switchgrass in ways that's better and you can produce in ways that's worse. Um, okay. You need to look at those practices that actually lead to good environmental benefits. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. And Mr. Grayson? No further questions. No further questions for the witnesses, Your Honor. Okay. Well, listen, we certainly thank you all for coming today to testify. And um, this concludes. I, actually, what I want to say is we will... The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments uh, and written questions from the members. So this hearing is adjourned. With, with, with our um, 90,000 gallons of jet and diesel we're delivering to the Navy this year, we're going to have a good bit more diesel mm -hmm. available. Okay.